one whiteboard marker. That was all that Roy Tan needed to turn up to class when he started teaching at the Institute of Technical Education 12 years ago. But these days, thanks to technology-enabled learning, teachers have turned it into a choreographed performance full of props. But since the pandemic, Roy has to add even more stuff to his teaching arsenal. A face mask to keep COVID-19 from spreading. A microphone so students can hear him through the mask and a battery pack for the mic. Ouch! How embarrassing. So he came up with this. Good morning class to... Sorry. Good morning class. Today we will learn about the speak and shield from Mr. Roy. This shield helps to amplify the lecturer's voice, but at the same time offers the same level of protection as just as any normal shield. This mellophone here, together with a diaphragm, creates the vibration to help amplify the sound. So in a classroom, Good morning, class. Students who are five meters apart, they actually can hear the lecturers better. Roy's gadget is just one of many being invented to help us deal with life in a pandemic. In this episode, I look into this current burst of creativity I get down and dirty with a robot from our sci-fi fantasies. Meet a supercomputer that could almost predict the future. And try to scare myself so I can stop touching my face. Just to see if these new innovations really work or are just gimmicks. If job security is the sole criteria for a match, one industry would be enjoying a burst of hits in this pandemic. Cleaning, particularly deep cleaning, is hard. In Singapore, demand for such services has jumped up to four times since the outbreak. Even Professor Chen Yiming and his team of scientists are jumping onto the cleaning bandwagon. Since February, they've been trying to build a cleaning robot. You might say, wait a minute, don't we already have cleaning robots? Uh, but you see, to deal with the coronavirus, cleaning the floors is not enough. You need to disinfect places above ground level, like switches, handles, doors, railings, and even walls, places which COVID-19 can linger and latch onto our hands. Presenting the Extreme Disinfectant Robot or as her makers call her, XD-Bot. She can reach all those places. Barely a month old and she's already had a sexy makeover. Wow, so this is the XD-Bot 2. Yes, the second version, we make it uh, slimmer and lighter because we can uh, fit into more um, cramped area. This one has a three degree freedom pen tilt arm and also a one degree freedom uh, lifting mechanism. You can turn, tilt. And move left and right. That's right, move left and right, yes. Achieve this four degree freedom movement to allow us to do the uh, disinfection work. So what's the difference between yours and the others? The major difference is really the, the intelligence. So he has eyes, they can uh, recognize all this, uh, your environment mm -hmm. to do the precise disinfection work. And because this spray gun, we, we also equip with a uh, camera. So this robot uh, will be able to see and then spray. Uh -huh. So it, it is not blindly spray. The eyes of the XD-Bot 2 are in the form of stereo cameras and light detecting and ranging sensors. These attachments allow it to see in three dimensions to gauge how far an object is and navigate accordingly. Coupled with its ability to clean surfaces that are three meters above ground, the XD-Bot can cover a room with disinfectant like no other cleaner can, be it robot or human. 
and Professor Chen is more than happy to let us put his baby to the test. Instead of disinfectant, we are filling her up with a fluorescent liquid. So to check where the spray has landed, we need UV light. And where it glows, it'll show. And it seems the XD pod is passing the test with flying fluorescent colors. This laptop on the table, for example, is glowing under UV light. Here's another high touch point that's out of reach for regular robot cleaners. Looks like the XD bot got to it. It even managed to reach every face of this door handle. Less than three months after it was invented, the XD bot was trialed at the Singapore General Hospital. There, it proved its metal by cleaning a consultation room in under 10 minutes. It was also put through a similar trial at a sporting goods emporium. But even with futuristic cleaning robots, the COVID-19 virus is one persistent bug. Research has shown that the virus survives on masks for up to seven days. Glass surfaces like our handphones for up to two days. Cloth for about a day. And we can't run away from touching these dirty surfaces. But what's worse is touching our faces after. So, it's this year's buzzword again. Don't touch your face. But not touching our faces to save our lives is easier said than done. So what does it take for us to stop? I may have something up my sleeves. Or wrist. There is a new world order, and it comes with a new set of rules. It dictates what we wear, where we stand, and what our hands should not touch. The one rule I find the hardest to obey, touching my face. Oops, I did it again. And I'm not alone. Research has shown that we touch our faces 23 times an hour on average. Why can't we keep our grubby paws off our faces? It seems like the habit starts from young. Children suck their thumbs or bite their nails whenever they are stressed or upset. It's a way to soothe themselves. As we grow older, Touching our faces becomes part of daily life, like scratching our chin when we are concentrating. For Matthew Tolls, it's picking on his acne. And he just couldn't stop. Until he came up with this. It's a smart wristband that buzzes whenever his hand reaches for his face. For about a year, Matthew had his hands full. In between picking on his acne, he was figuring out the hardware for the wristband and coming up with an app to track the movements. He succeeded in making the wristband. US President Donald Trump has been criticised And then the pandemic struck in the United States. It's very clear that the most pressing issue is inadequate testing. As the US White House struggled to come up with a coordinated response to the pandemic, Americans started looking for their own solutions to protect themselves. So Matthew and his team worked non-stop for two weeks to reconfigure their wristband to catch faster gestures like face touching. Who are most of your users actually? So most of our users are immunocompromised or elderly people who are at increased risk and are willing to do whatever it takes to protect themselves and the people around them. How long do you need for people to be conditioned to this new habit? People will learn very quickly and, and will have some noticeable effects for the rest of the day. And so the longer you have it on, the more uh, 
uh, strength you will build up and the more mental fortitude you'll have. But um, really, the, the results are quite quick. Wow. All right. So just after a few days and you don't need to wear the band anymore? Like all habits, it takes some amount of effort to retain the benefits. It's really not as straightforward as, you know, just wear it for this amount of time and, and you'll get results. It's, it's really a process. Could this device break my face touching habits? I'm going to give it a go. Okay, I've been wearing this wristband for a day and it's recorded me touching my face 50 times. But truth be told, after a while, I got used to the light buzzing that I could just easily ignore it. I wonder if there's a way to make this product more effective. And I know just the person who can help me. Benjamin Sher is a local user's experience designer who specializes in designing smart devices. His company has won over 30 international awards for their work. Benjamin has agreed to modify the wristband to give it more of a kick, so I can no longer ignore any of its alerts. Now the device will let out an awful blare rather than simply buzz. Okay, I should not touch my nose. Okay. I was just touching my temple. I haven't even touched yet. My hands just here. Okay, Ben, this thing was super annoying. Okay. It served its purpose it then. It was so loud. <laughs> other people could hear it. I mean, obviously I could, but other people could hear it as well. Were oh. oh, the public giving you the eyes? <laughs> I was definitely embarrassed uh, when this sounded out in public. It really made me put my hand down. Okay, but how, how else would you improve on this apart from the size and the looks of it? If it's for kids, maybe we would incorporate some other aspects like gamification. Let's say, for example, the kids has five lives and they are only allowed to touch their face for five times. Ah, yeah, whenever, I time, see. whenever they, they touch, touch their face, their life, they lose a life. Yeah, they lose a life. When it comes to touching my face, this modified wristband with the louder alert kept me on a short leash. But I think I'd prefer getting reminders from a faithful four-legged friend. When software engineers from GovTech first got this futuristic canine from US company Boston Dynamics, it already knew how to climb stairs, traverse uneven terrain, and even dance. But the GovTech engineers wanted to teach it some new tricks. After seven months of training, Spot can now call you out if you've been a bad boy. Hey, Spot. Oh, oops. Sorry. Let's keep Singapore healthy. Spotting rule breakers is a walk in the park for Spot. He can, well, spot if you're standing too close to another person. For your own safety and for those around you, please stay at least one meter apart. Thank you. He can also tell when someone isn't wearing his mask properly. Please wear your mask. Thank you. Today, I join engineer and spot whisperer Mr. Chong Tia Yi to see how Spot does his paw patrol. How does Spot spot people who break the rules? So there's two things that are going on. One of them is it actually can track or detect the number of people in the scene based on the input uh, video feed that's streamed in from its uh, front sensors. The other thing it can do is we've also trained a couple of what we call uh, neural networks. They actually mimic how the human brain works based on hundreds of thousands of examples. So it can also detect not just people, but also detect if a person is actually wearing a mask. That's all based off uh, a technique called deep learning. What if someone is just wearing a mask halfway? So there is a mask, but it's only like maybe not covering the nose or hanging off the ear. Yeah, so I mean, I cannot guarantee it's 100% accurate, but uh, in many cases, it'll do a, an appropriate job. Because the reason is because we also feed it examples of people uh, wearing, say, masks incorrectly. We also train it with poor lighting. 
as it sees more of the world around it, it actually learns. Mm -hmm. That's what machine learning is. So it actually gets more and more accurate over time. Are we the first in the world to train a robot dog like this? I wouldn't say we're the first in the world to do it, but I think we're one of the first. So uh, this robot is actually controlled over 4G with all the video and imagery streamed uh, in real time from the dog into a control center that you can, you can sit comfortably in your office, uh, air conditioned anywhere in Singapore. Uh -huh. And you can pilot this dog uh, remotely. So we've actually done it already. We've actually piloted Spot over here over four or five kilometers remotely. Right. So we're very confident about the system we've developed. It's remarkable how man's best friend can alert us when we get too close to each other. But I can think of one situation where crowds will be unavoidable. Like on public transport during peak hours. Ah, that was my bus. If I'm on a packed train and a COVID-19 infected person enters the carriage, what are the chances that I would catch the virus as well? Are wearing masks and not talking enough to keep the virus from spreading? I want to know for sure. And so do the Japanese, which is why they are turning to a computer. No, not this kind, but a super computer. Supercomputers are able to process information so fast because they work in an entirely different manner from ordinary computers. Your regular desktop is a little like the cashier at the grocery store. No matter how fast you pass your items to him, the speed of the chip depends on how fast he can scan and process the items. And he can only do so one item at a time. But supercomputers can split problems into many pieces and work on all of them at the same time. It's like splitting a giant shopping cart of items across many different checkout counters. It's a faster and more efficient process. Cut. Sound good? Can I? On an ordinary computer, simulations like this may take up to two weeks to render. Action. On a supercomputer, it takes only a few hours. I'm meeting Fugaku. Fugaku is the world's fastest supercomputer. It's being put to work, simulating the behaviour of virus-laden droplets in a moving train. So, Professor, can you please tell me more about this train simulation? We're finding that uh, these packed trains actually cause significant stagnation in the flow of air, thus making people more susceptible to transmission, especially aerosols, for, uh, for these uh, coronavirus epidemic. So, um, when you have... Uh, let's say 50% capacity, when people, most people are sitting down on chairs, mm -hmm. then the ventilation is fantastic. But when you have uh, people shoulder to shoulder, mm -hmm. then the airflow becomes maybe like one-fifth of, um, a, or even one-tenth of a very uh, typical office environment. It's only three times more people. Uh, but you know, there's drastic change in the risk being minimal to significant risk. But isn't it common sense that the more you pack a train, the less ventilation there is, um, the higher the infection rate or the more stagnant the air is. Do we need a supercomputer to tell us that? Uh, yes, of course, you can play with common sense. But the new norm is about com you know, compromising our daily lives. But how much are we, you know, do we need to compromise? But it should be based on you know, certain scientific grounds. So you need to come to a balance. And that can only be done with very precise simulations. For example, the shields and typical Japanese office space, the partitions in between desks is about 120 centimeters. Only by raising the shield by 20 centimeters to 104, we found that it blocks all the droplets and also the aerosols, which can be blocked and sort of uh, elevated out, upwards, such that they can be taken care of by the ventilation system. So there's a huge difference between just this 20 centimeters, only like this difference, this difference, right? But this 20 centimeters makes a world difference with respect to transmission of the virus to someone who is sitting across from you. So um, these, there are many things we don't know unless we do large-scale experiments or you can simulate to arrive at a fairly exact number by which you can you know, set, uh, establish various policies. 
While Fugaku calibrates the risks for us in the new normal, other inventors are in a race against time to save lives. As the number of COVID-19 patients soar, so does demand for ventilators. These machines deliver much-needed oxygen to patients whose lungs were ravaged by the disease. But early in the pandemic, it looked like the world was going to run severely short of ventilators. So in April, the Masik Foundation teamed up with Neon Polytechnic to strategize. Two weeks later, this 100% designed in Singapore ventilator was born. But it's not just a copy of existing ventilators. We call it NIV helmet. NIV stands for non-invasive ventilation. That means you don't have to insert a tube through the mouth. Mm -hmm. Okay, now this helmet, what we have is, we have an enriched oxygen environment inside. There's an inlet there. Okay. Okay, you, you mind connecting this inlet? Is this it? Yeah. Okay, so this one will supply oxygen from the oxygen concentrators. Mm -hmm. You can turn on the oxygen concentrator. Okay, so I'll just turn these machines on? Yes. Hello. So now what is happening, this patient is getting uh, more oxygen at a little bit higher pressure. Why do you need higher pressure? The higher pressure helps to open up the airway. So patient will breathe in more oxygen more comfortably. Mm -hmm. So that is how we support the COVID-19 patients. Now this is not something that we use in everyday uh, treatment. Uh, this is something for a situation when our capacity, the healthcare capacity is not able to cope. Mm -hmm. uh, we have developed in Singapore and this whole thing can be manufactured in Singapore. That's the idea. Uh -huh. Okay, something which will make us self-sufficient. So this, set, this has been developed for a non-hospital setting. I see. It could be a field hospital, it's a community hospital. Whole thing can be set up in about five minutes time. Okay. So it is just, just to help uh, those people who cannot get a bed in the ICUs in the hospital. That's right. No one knows exactly how the world will look like in the aftermath of the pandemic, but you never want a crisis to go to waste. It's an opportunity to try new things and think outside of the box. Come on. The silver lining to all this is that the crisis has unleashed a whole new wave of creativity. It's made us use technology we've never thought possible, it's pushed our engineering limits, and accelerated our learning curve. That's why it matters. Right, boy? Right spot? <laughs>